skipping forward from page 58, which is the beginning of how it works, to page 60, we've got the A, Bs, and Cs that we discussed. A, that we're alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. Anybody struggling with that still? Anybody hung up on the first step? Doesn't understand what it means to be an alcoholic? Isn't sure that that applies to them? Good. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism, and C, that God could and would if he were sought. Everybody okay with being willing to embark on a relationship with a power greater than themselves? Okay, great. So, being convinced we were at step three, which is that we decided to turn our will and our life over to the care of God as we understood him. Just what do we mean by that, and just what do we do? Two important statements. What do we mean by turning our will and our life over to the care of God? And exactly how do we go about doing that? The first requirement. My sponsor convinced me, it took a lot of effort, but he convinced me when they use the word first, they, mean you, they want you to start there. I had trouble with that. I used to skip forward in the book and, and wonder why I wasn't getting it. The first requirement is that we be convinced that any life or our own self-will can hardly be a success. Before we can enter into the third step, we have to become convinced that any life or our own self-will can hardly be a success. So we have to define those words. What's self? Self is the I behind all of the statements of I want, I need, I see, I think. Self is the I, it's the me. It's what I identify in my core as being responsible or behind most of my thoughts and desires. What's will? Thinking. If I will myself to drink this cup of tea, then that's the thinking behind the action of drinking the tea. I have to will it for it to be. Does that make sense? You're not going to get anywhere without will. He's your best friend. Will is necessary for any action. We've got to have will. So understanding those two words, what's self-will? Thinking as it relates to self. I think this should be a certain way. I think that should be a certain way. See how that works? Thinking as it relates to the self. So, the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. On that basis, we're almost always in collision with something or somebody. Why is that? Why would we always be in collision with something or somebody? If everybody in this room is running on self-will and we all get the idea that we want to drink this cup of tea, what's going to happen? Collision. Here's this bottle of water, full bottle of water. Chris, what happens when you think you should have some water? You take the water. Now, at the same time that Chris thinks he should have some water, I think I should have some water. So now what happens? Collision. We both get the idea or the design on a certain something in life, and we go after it, and we collide. And it happens in the simplest ways. Throughout our entire lives, what happens is we run our lives by self-propulsion, by self-will. We think about the way we think things should be, and then we take actions based on that thinking, and we try and bring those things into being. And the problem is, is that our neighbor is doing the exact same thing. It happens all the time on the freeway. Every time you get on the highway, there's two cars trying to get in the same lane at the same time. We live by self-will. We live by self-propulsion. The usual outcome is, is that we're in collision with something or someone. So he says most people try to live by self-propulsion. Each person is like the actor who wants to run the whole show. So he gives us this whole great analogy, or metaphor rather, about an actor trying to run the show. It's not an accident that he uses the actor as, as the metaphor. He's forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, and the scenery, and the rest of the players in his own way. If his arrangements would only stay put, if only people would do as he wished, the show would be great. Everybody, including himself, would be pleased. Life would be wonderful. In trying to make these arrangements, our actor may be sometimes quite virtuous, meaning he may be a really great guy. He may be kind, considerate, and patient, generous, even modest and self-sacrificing. On the other hand, he may be mean, egotistical, selfish, or dishonest. But as with most humans, he's more likely to have varied traits. So it doesn't matter whether we're nice people or whether we're real jerks. What happens is, is we're convinced of the way we think life should be for ourselves, and then we act in a way to try to bring that about. Now notice he hasn't mentioned the alcoholic at all yet. He's just talking about most people. Most people try to live by self-propulsion. As human beings, we're brought up into a world where we're taught to believe that if you see something and you want it to be a certain way, you should try and make it be that way. That's what we believe, that's what we grow up in, that's what we live by. What usually happens? The show doesn't come off very well. He begins to think life doesn't treat him right. He decides to exert himself more. He becomes, on the next occasion, still more demanding or gracious as the case may be. Still, the play does not suit him. Admitting he may be somewhat at fault, 
He's sure that other people are more to blame. He becomes angry, indignant, self-pitying. We go through life, we get involved in situations, we look around, we figure out where other people are wrong, and then we move on to the next situation. Problem is, is another group of people shows up, we go through life with them, something goes wrong, we figure out where they're wrong, and then we move on to the next situation. We do it over and over and over again. Each person is like an actor trying to run the whole show. An actor has a role to fill. The actor isn't the director. The actor isn't the playwright. The actor isn't in charge of, of the choreography or of arranging the scenery. The actor is only supposed to fulfill their role. But most of us live by self-propulsion. We miss filling our role entirely because we're consumed with getting the show to turn out the way we think it ought to. We live by self-propulsion. We live by self-will, thinking consumed by the self. What's his basic trouble? Is he not really a self-seeker even when trying to be kind? Is he not the victim of the delusion that he can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he only manages well? What's it mean to be a victim? To suffer the consequence. That's what it means to be a victim. To be a victim means you are the one who receives the consequences of an action. Whether it's self-inflicted doesn't matter. That's just what it means to be a victim. So here he's telling us, isn't he not a victim of the delusion? What's a delusion? To believe in something that's not real. To have a fantasy telling you that it's this way when it's really not this way, right? So the victim of the delusion that he can rest means to receive or to get or take satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he only manages well. The actor trying to run the whole show, trying to arrange the show to suit his fancy. The victim of the delusion, suffering from the false belief that we'll be happy and satisfied if we only manage well. The first requirement is that we become convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. The first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. A life run on self-will results in being the victim of the delusion that we'll be happy and satisfied if we only manage well. Is it not evident to all the rest of the players and that these are the things he wants, and do not his actions make each of them wish to retaliate, snatching all they can get out of the show? Is, it, is he not, even in his best moments, a producer of confusion rather than harmony? Our actor is self-centered egocentric, as people like to call it nowadays. He's like the retired businessman who lulls in the Florida sunshine in the winter complaining of the sad state of the nation. The minister who sighs over the sins of the 20th century, politicians and reformers who are sure all would be utopia if the rest of the world would only behave. The outlaw safecracker who thinks society has wronged him, and the alcoholic who has lost all and is locked up. Whatever our protestations, in other words, whatever our arguments, however we disagree with that, are not most of us concerned with ourselves, our resentments, or our self-pity. We're the victims of the delusion that we'll be happy and satisfied if we only manage well. We live by self-will, we live by self-propulsion. We're concerned with ourselves, our resentments, and our self-pity. Selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Driven, literally driven, by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation, but we invariably find that at some time in the past we've made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. So our troubles we think are basically their own making, they arise out of ourselves. And the alcoholic, it's the first time we've mentioned the alcoholic. The alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot. The alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of selfishness. What does that mean, above everything? It means before we can go forward, most of all, most importantly, we've got to get rid of selfishness. We're not going to be able to stay sober if we're still as selfish as we are. We've got to get over self-centeredness. We've got to. We've got to or it kills us. We must or it kills us. God makes that possible. And there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. Many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them, even though 
We would have liked to. Like everybody in here got told when you were four years old, you have to share. You've got to share. It's nice to share. We kind of got coerced into it. Well, people like people who share, but none of us like to share. There's one bottle of water. Both Chris wants it and I want it at the same time. One of us is going to try and take it from the other because we just don't want to share. We're driven by self-will. We're the victims of the delusion that we'll be happy and satisfied if we manage well. If we only adjust, manage, change, alter life enough to suit ourselves, then we'll be happy and satisfied. If we can only get the people around us to do what we think, then we'll be happy and satisfied. If we can only get our kids to behave, then we'll be happy and satisfied. If the Democrats would stop doing what they're doing, then the Republicans would be happy. And for the Democrats, it's the same thing. If the Republicans would stop doing what they're doing, then they'd be happy. We literally live from moment to moment to moment, waiting for life to show up in a way that'll make us happy. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It says, many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them, even though we would have liked to. Neither could we reduce self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own power. We had to have God's help. This is the how and the why of it. So first he's going to tell us how we get God's help and get rid of self-centeredness, and then he's going to tell us why. First, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Now most of us sit here and think, but wait, I'm not playing God. I may be a little selfish, but I'm not really playing God. But aren't we? Aren't we really, when we're trying to arrange the outside world to suit ourselves, aren't we really playing God? If the alcoholic really thought it would work, instead of watering our plants, we would sit in front of them and go, grow, 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 grow. We would. We really would. We're playing God. Worth looking at the outside world thinking, if I can just arrange it, if I can get it to be the way I think it ought to be, then I'll be happy and satisfied. That's playing God. We're driving six cars when we go down the highway. <laughs> Ours and the five others in front of us, while the four others in front of us and the one guy tailgating us thinking, if only they would do this, then I'll be happy and satisfied. We literally live from moment to moment to moment trying to arrange the outside world so we can be happy and satisfied. We're playing God. So the first part of working the third step is to quit playing God, to give up trying to control the outside world and get it to be the way we think it ought to be. Even though you're probably right and it would be better off if everybody just did it your way. The first part of working the third step is giving up playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. He's the principal, we are his agents. He is the father and we are his children. Most good ideas are simple. And this concept was the keystone, meaning the center point, the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we pass to freedom. When we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer. Being all powerful, he provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. So that's not a statement of reward and punishment. What he's saying is that the result of giving over running the world to God is you don't have to worry about running the world anymore. Give up running the world and then you don't have to worry about running the world anymore. Give up playing God, and then you don't have to worry about running the world anymore. And as a result of doing that, you'll get whatever you need in your life to take care of what you need to take care of in your life. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. More and more, we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. As we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of His presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter. We were reborn. So then we've got the famous third step prayer. Funniest thing about the third step prayer is that when you skip down to the next paragraph, where it says we found it very desirable to take this spiritual step with another understanding person, on page 63 it says, the wording, of course, was quite optional, so long as we expressed the idea of voicing it without reservation. Most of us never think about what the idea behind the third step is. The idea behind the third step is that we have to quit playing God and look to see where we can contribute. We have to fulfill our role in life rather than arranging the play to suit ourselves. Quit playing God and look to see what you can contribute. That's how we work the third step. We literally forget that the world existed before we were born. 
and it ran just fine without us. And it's going to be around long after we die. And it's going to run just fine without us then too. We never just be the actor trying to fulfill his role in life or her role in life. We walk around playing God, trying to run the whole show, trying to arrange the lights, the rest of the characters, the ballet, and the music to suit our fancy. That's what we do. We live life as if we were in charge. And we live from moment to moment to moment, waiting for life to show up the way we think it ought to so we can be happy. And it never works out. Because it's just a matter of one little thing being out of whack for us to get upset. So the way we work the third step, what Alcoholics Anonymous suggests that we're doing, is give up playing God, stop trying to run the outside world, and instead, in any situation we're in in life, look to see what we can contribute. What's my role to fill? I'm an actor, not the director. How can I fulfill my role in the world? What is there for me to contribute in any situation I go through? You can read the third step prayer all you want, but if you're like me, what you do is you read the third step prayer, then you leave your house in the morning, you get in the car, and you go out and start running the show. The third step prayer doesn't work the third step. We work the third step by not playing God and looking to see what we can contribute. This was only a beginning, though if honestly and humbly made, an effect, sometimes a very great one, was felt at once. Now, although the wording for taking step three is optional, we're provided with a prayer that we can use to take the third step. Now, Brian is going to read this prayer to us first, and then we're going to gather in a circle, and we're going to um, read this prayer together. Okay, it says, We were now at step three. Many of us said to our Maker, as we understood him, God, I offer myself to thee, to build with me and do with me as thy will. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy, that I would help of thy power, thy love, thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Okay, let's get up and form a circle. And now you do have this on one of your, your handouts, so if you can lay them around on the table so that we can see one big circle. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Amen. Congratulations, we've done the third step. The first part of developing a relationship with a power greater than ourselves after making the decision that we're going to try and do it is taking a fourth step, it's writing an inventory. Though our decision, the third step, was a vital and crucial step it could have little permanent effect unless at once, when? At once, immediately. At once, followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom, so we had to get down to causes and conditions. So what Bill's telling us is that there's aspects of self that block us off from a relationship with God. It's like we carry around an umbrella all day long using the metaphor of God as being the sunlight. So we carry around an umbrella all day long, and we hold this umbrella over our heads, and we go, okay, God, tell me what to do. And there's no light coming in, because we've got this umbrella. And every once in a while, we move it a little out of the way, and that feels great, and we're like, oh, that's nice, I like that. And then we put the umbrella right back in place, and we go off and run around doing whatever we want to do. The victim of the delusion that we'll be happy and satisfied if we manage well. We have to get rid of the things in ourselves which are blocking us. 
which are blocking us from the relationship with a power greater than ourselves. So we enter into this third step, and we find out that we've been playing God. That really what's been going on, the reason why we've been cut off from a relationship with a power greater than ourselves is because we live by self-propulsion, by self-will. And self is so powerful and so strong that it's not going to let God come anywhere near us. Otherwise, we might find out that our distortion or our perception of the world is wrong. So we're insulated from a relationship with a power greater than ourselves because of self being blown out of proportion. So he tells us here as we're entering into the fourth step, the space between the third and the fourth step, he says we had to get rid of the things in ourselves which were blocking us. We've got to get rid of the things in ourselves which were blocking us from a relationship with God. So we had to get down to causes and conditions. What's a cause? Something that produces an effect or a result. Something that produces an effect or a result is a cause. What's a condition? The state of something, exactly, the environment. So what we're talking about is getting down, the whole idea of taking a fourth step is to get down to the causes and conditions of how self becomes inflated and disrupts our relationship with a power greater than ourselves. Why do we live by self-propulsion? Because we don't have a relationship with a power greater than ourselves. Once we have a relationship with God with a power greater than ourselves, and we can trust and have faith in that relationship, we're not consumed with arranging the world to meet our needs. Because we believe that things are going to be okay. It's a level of optimism that we can carry in our life. Because we know that there's, there's some kind of an op a force operating in our lives bigger than us, directing the show. Our job is to quit playing God and see what we can contribute. And so in order to best see how we can contribute, we've got to get rid of the things in ourselves which are blocking us from that relationship with God. Quite simply said, the fourth step is merely taking a look at your life and seeing how you get blocked off from a relationship with God. That's all it is. It's nothing to be scared of. If anything, it's miraculous. Because it's going to let us know the places in our lives which self flares up and blocks us off from a relationship with God. So once we take the fourth step, we're going to have an insight into the way we've been living life that's going to really be a blessing for us. When we take an inventory, a fact-finding process, we get down to the causes and conditions of how self works in our life and disrupts us in these relationships with others, we get this picture of a pattern of the way that we live life. And we see how these key little fundamental things are screwing us up at every turn. And then we don't magically not do them anymore. Instead, we've got an awareness of them. But prior to taking a four-step inventory, we've got no idea how self works in our life. We have no idea how we're blocked off from God. So we take the third step, and then we move on with life. And we go out, and we have another day where we get in the car and there's traffic. We get to work, and the boss is there. The guy that we hate's at work. The phone call comes that annoys us the most. Whatever the situations are, they happen over and over and over again. And we're miserable. So the fourth step is a relief for us. It's an opportunity to uncover in our lives the things that are blocking us from this relationship with God. And remember, we started this whole thing in the doctor's opinion by finding out that we had to have an entire psychic change. So the fourth step is going to show us the areas in life that we need to change the most. So it says, therefore, we started on a personal inventory. This was step four. Gives the, uh, the metaphor of a business taking inventory so that we understand that it's a fact-finding process. Skipping down, he said, we did exactly the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly. First, meaning we start here, we searched out the flaws in our makeup which caused our failure. What was our failure? This effort to live by self-propulsion. So we want to search out the aspects of self which most disrupt our relationships with others. Being convinced that self manifested in various ways was what had defeated us, we considered its common manifestations. Resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From it stem all forms of spiritual disease. We have not only been mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. In dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. We listed the people, institutions, and principles with whom we were angry. So, in the margin of your book, next to the line which says, we listed the people, institutions, or principles with whom we were angry, put a number one. So everybody should have a number one in the margin of the book next to the line which says, we listed the people, institutions, or principles with whom we are angry. Now on this sheet of paper, you'll notice that I drew a column 
on the left side of the paper, and I put a number one at the very top. And that number one really looks identical to the number one that I've got in my book, because that's the first column of your fourth step inventory. So the first column is who. And it says we listed the people, institutions, or principles with whom we're angry. So that's all you have to do is list them. So who am I angry at? Let's see. Got my mom on here, my sister, the IRS. That's an institution, right? My high school. That's an institution. I hated the way they treated me there. What about, uh, what else? Uh, principles. I'm angry at some principles. What principles am I angry at? Honesty. Honesty. That's my favorite one. Why should I have to tell the truth? I can't get my way. What else? Integrity. Okay. Integrity. I don't want to have to have integrity. Sharing. It's a principle. Authority is an institution most of the time. Monogamy. Monogamy is a great principle to be angry at. Right? Okay. So you get the picture. What we do is we brainstorm. We list everything we can imagine. Skip a little bit of space in between each person, institution or principle so that you can come back in and, and fill out the rest of the columns and you'll have plenty of room. So the way it looks is that all the way down the left margin of my paper, underneath the number one, where I wrote who, I've got a list of names. So then the next direction is, we asked ourselves why we were angry. So put a number two in the margin of your book next to the line that says, we asked ourselves why we were angry. And you'll notice that on my fourth step inventory, I've written a number two at the top of the page and that number two looks identical to the number two in the margin of my book because that's my second column. So the next thing I do, first I fill in all of column number one. I leave a little space between each name. Then I come down and I fill in all of column number two. So I ask myself why I'm angry. Why am I angry at my mom? She gives money to my sister instead of giving money to me. Why am I angry at my sister? She takes money from my mom. It's interfering with my financial security. Why am I mad at the IRS? Because they take my money. They can lock me up in jail. They make me scared, fearful. Why am I mad at school? I don't even remember why I'm mad at school, but damn it, I'm mad, right? Why am I mad at honesty? Because I don't like having to tell people the truth because I can't get my way. Whatever your reasons are, you just list them right next to the name that you put down in column number one. It's real simple and it's real brief. All you have to do is write a little note. You don't have to write a big story. Don't write a big story because the person you do your fist step with doesn't want to hear a big story. We're not writing our life story. What we're doing is we're looking for the causes and conditions of how self works in our life and blocks us off from the relationship with God. So what we're trying to uncover is a pattern in the way that we're living life. So it says, in most cases, it was found that our self-esteem, pocketbooks, ambitions, personal relationships, including sex, were hurt or threatened. So we were sore, we were burnt up. On our grudge list, we set opposite each name our injury. Was it our self-esteem, security, ambitions, personal, or sex relations which had been interfered with? In the margin of your book, next to the statement, was it our self-esteem, security, ambitions, personal, or sex relations which had been interfered with? Put a number three. Your inventory is going to have, at this point, four columns drawn out. Three of them are labeled. The first is the who. The second is the why, and the third is what's affected in you. And it's going to look just like Bill's example on page 65. Now, in Bill's example on page 65, at the bottom of the page, he also has the word pride. So we add the word pride to this list of words that we just read that we wrote the number three next to. Now, those are the only words that go in the third column. Those are the only words that go in the third column. You don't want to, uh, to write a story in the third column about why you were affected or what was affected in you. Just use these words, keep it simple, it works. Trust me, it works. So we've got six things. Self-esteem, security, ambitions, personal, sex relations, and pride. Those are the six things that go in the third column, the affects my column. You'll also notice that in Bill's example, the word fear is bracketed alongside all of the things that he lists as being affected. Wherever the word ambitions or security shows up in this column, put the word fear in brackets next to it. Ambitions is you wanting something to come out or be a certain way, and security is wanting it to not change the way that it is, right? Having a fear of losing something that you have. So put the word fear in brackets whenever you've got the word ambitions or security. 
or if you've got a fear related to it, but you didn't write the word security or ambitions for some reason, then write the word fear and put that in brackets also. You're going to need it later. Got it? Even if you don't have an ambition or a security that's being threatened in, and that you wrote down in the effects my column, in the third column, put the word fear in brackets if you've got a fear related to the resentment. Like, I'm afraid of being honest with people. So I write the word fear in brackets in the third column. And that's the only thing that I want to write in the third column is these six words and the word fear that he's given me here. I want to keep it as simple as possible. I'm just trying to get down to the causes and conditions, I'm trying to get down to a picture of how I live my life, how I interact with others, and how self works in those relationships. So at the bottom of the page, he says, we went back through our lives, nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. So what's important? Thoroughness and honesty. Thoroughness and honesty, exactly. Nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. What that means is you want to write down everybody you can possibly think of. He tells us at the beginning of the directions, he says, we listed the people, institutions, or principles with whom we were angry. Everybody you can ever think of that you've been angry about. When we were finished, we considered it carefully. That's a direction. So put an asterisk next to the statement at the bottom of page 65 that says, when we were finished, we considered it carefully. The first thing apparent was that this world and its people were often quite wrong. To conclude that others was wrong was as far as most of us ever got. The usual outcome was that people continued to wrong us and we stayed sore. So we live from situation to situation, as we talked about in the third step. Things don't work out the way we think they ought to. We look around at the show and we decide where everybody else is wrong, and then we move on. What's going to happen? We're going to go to work at some other job where everybody else is going to be wrong, and then we're going to have to move on again. Then we're going to marry somebody. Then we're going to find out where they're wrong. So we're going to get a divorce. We're going to marry somebody else. They're going to be wrong too. Six or seven times later, there begins to be a pattern. To conclude that others, was, that others were wrong was as far as most of us ever got. The usual outcome was that people continued to wrong us and we stayed sore. Sometimes it was remorse. Then we were sore at ourselves. But the more we fought and tried to have our own way, the worse matters got. As in war, the victor only seemed to win. Our moments of triumph were short-lived. It's plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. To the precise extent, meaning exactly to the same amount, that we permit these, do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile. But with the alcoholic, whose hope is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. We found that it is fatal. For when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit, the insanity of alcohol returns, and we drink again. And with us, to drink is to die. Remember back on page 35, we were talking about the disease of alcoholism, and then in the top of page 35, we said, so we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse into drinking, for obviously this is the crux of the problem. And then we went through and we talked about this guy named Jim who was angry about having to work at a car dealership he used to own. Jim had all the self-knowledge in the world. He knew that he was an alcoholic and he knew that he couldn't drink. But Jim had resentments and fears. He was restless, irritable, and discontent. So all the self-knowledge in the world wouldn't prevent Jim from taking the first drink. It just wouldn't. We have to be rid of these resentments. We must or it kills us. We found that it is fatal. From harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. Our relationship with God is the basis of our sobriety. We embark on that relationship in the third step. When we're shut off from that relationship, the insanity of alcohol returns, meaning the thinking that I can somehow control my drinking. Or no thought whatsoever. We start to drink as if the alcohol were ginger ale. The insanity of alcohol returns and we drink again. If we were to live, we had to be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm were not for us. That means we couldn't be consumed all the time with thinking about the way things are and the way they should be. And we can't walk around pissed off, grumpy. The grouch and the brainstorm. You ever notice that four days after somebody cuts you off in traffic, every time you drive by the same place, you think, I'm going to get that guy? <laughs> the grouch and the brainstorm are not for us. They may be the dubious luxury of normal men, but for alcoholics, these things are poison. We turn back to the list for it held the key to the future. Prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. Put an asterisk next to the statement, we turn back to the list for it held the key to the future. That's a direction. So we've already looked at the list once. 
and we've seen where the world and its people are often quite wrong. So you review your list and you look at it and you say, you know what, it is wrong for my mom to give money to my sister, it's wrong for my sister to take the money, it's wrong for you know, people to tease me when I'm in school, it's wrong that I have to tell the truth and I can't get my way. You can conclude all these things. You can figure out where everybody else is wrong. But then you have to start to acknowledge that all of the other people in the world may be wrong, but they're owning you. They're eating your lunch on a daily basis. Our resentments are dominating us. So we turn back to the list a second time, prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle, we began to see that the world and its people really dominated us. In that state, the wrongdoing of others, fancied or real, had power to actually kill. How could we escape? We saw that these resentments must be mastered, but how? We could not wish them away any more than alcohol. This was our course. We discussed a course when we started the study, right? What's a course? A directed path of action. So he's going to tell us exactly how to get over our resentments. We realized that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick. So we turn back to the list a second time now. We look at each person on the list and we think about them. And we think about the situation. We think, is this person complete, whole and complete, or right in their relationship with God? Would they really be doing what they're doing if they had a God in their lives that was the solution to all their problems today? Are they spiritually sick? We realized that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick. Though we did not like their symptoms and the way these disturbed us, they, like ourselves, were sick too. We asked God to help us show them the same tolerance and pity and patience we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. So we say a little prayer about each person on our list. We look at it, we see where they may be spiritually sick, and we say a little prayer. It goes something like this. God, please help me be patient, tolerant, and accepting of this person. Help them to get over whatever it is that's got them being spiritually sick. We don't say a prayer like, God, please let them get hit by a truck. That's not what this is about. We're trying to find a way that we can forgive the people in our lives, and so we're trying to see where they're spiritually sick, and we pray for each person on the list. When a person offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man, how can I be helpful to him? God, save me from being angry, thy will be done. It's that simple. So that's the second time we've referred back to our list. We've written out the three columns. We do all of column number one, all of column number two, all of column number three. Then we look at the list once, and we figure out where everybody else in the world is wrong. Then we all come to the conclusion that they may be wrong, but it's killing us. Then we look at the list a second time, we realize where the people are spiritually sick and we say a prayer for each one of them hoping that we can find some way to forgive them or to understand them and now he tells us this weird thing he says we avoid retaliation or argument we wouldn't treat sick people that way why does he throw this in in the middle of all these directions that he's giving us because the first thing that you're going to want to do after you conclude that they're spiritually sick is call them up and say you know mom I took an inventory and I saw where you're wrong and I see that you're spiritually sick and I forgive you. We're going to go to work Monday morning, we're going to have our, our inventory halfway done, we're going to go up to that guy we hate at the office, we're going to look at him and go, you know, you're really a sick SOB, you've got no God in your life, but I forgive you. So we need to avoid that, right? Avoid retaliation or argument. We wouldn't treat sick people that way. If we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. So what you might consider is that as you're in the middle of the inventory taking process, avoid conversations if possible, and at all costs, avoid conflicts with the people that you're writing down on your inventory list. Question. You know, it's an interesting question. Why does the fourth step create so much fear? Most of the time, I think it's because we don't actually understand what we're doing in the fourth step. We don't understand the third step. And so we don't understand that in the fourth step, what we're doing is we're trying to get the stuff out of the way for us that blocks us off with God. The fourth step's a funny thing. You're making a list of all these defective relationships you have with other people. Then you're going to make a list of all your fears. So that's the first and the second part of the inventory. Then you're going to make a sex inventory. You're going to review your own sex conduct over the years. Where have you done harm? So we're all afraid of doing that. Here's the crazy thing. You've done it already. This is your life. You've been doing this, if you're 45 years old, you've been doing this for, you know, 44 of the 45 years. You've already lived it. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to fear. 
You've already lived it. What we're going to do now is get it out of the way so it doesn't block us off from a relationship with God. I don't know. It may be different for each person. The question was, is it shame? I don't know. It's different for each person. Most often what I've found is that it's, it's not understanding what we're trying to do. And that when I put it in the proper perspective, it's really about me developing a relationship with a power greater than myself. And maybe what might make me fearful of doing a fourth step is I really haven't taken the third step. I'm really not willing to turn my life over to the care of a God. I'm just really not willing to do it. And I don't want to acknowledge that. That's a possibility. I don't want to discover the things in myself which are blocking me from God because I want to remain blocked. Then I can go drink again and be happy. After all, drinking was working great. <laughs> Humility is not a voluntary thing, was a response somebody gave. It's true. It's absolutely true. We read it earlier in the book. Who wishes to admit complete defeat? We don't want to do it. But we become convinced of the hopelessness and futility of the way we've been living life. If you're convinced of the hopelessness and futility of the way you're living life, then there's nothing else to do. Or go find another way to get sober. AA doesn't pick fights, make bones with anybody who finds another way to get sober. We just don't do it. If you can find another way to get sober, great. Feel free. Skipping down, next paragraph, page 67, he says, referring to our list again, putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done, we resolutely looked for our mistakes. So now how many times have we referred to our list after writing the first three columns? Three. The first time we conclude whether people are wrong. The second time, we try to forgive them, say a little prayer for each of them. The third time, putting out of our minds wrongs others had done, we resolutely looked for our mistakes, where we've been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened. Though a situation had not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. Where were we to blame? The inventory was ours, not the other man's. So, the fourth column. If you put a four in the margin of your book, next to the line where it says where it had been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, or frightened, the fourth column is the my part column. Some people ask the question, well, Bill doesn't have four columns in his example. Well, that's because Bill had to come back and give you two other sets of directions in between finishing the third column and writing the fourth column. So now he's telling you to write the fourth column. Putting out of our minds the wrongs others have done, we resolutely look for our own mistakes, where we've been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, or frightened. So that's the only thing that needs to go in the my part column. Though a situation had not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. Where were we to blame? The inventory was ours, not the other man's. When we saw our faults, we listed them. We placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly and were willing to set these matters straight. There may be situations in your life where you don't see a part that you played in it. If you were a child and you were attacked or molested or, or brutalized by another human being, you might not have played a part in that at all. So you can leave that blank here. There's lots of things people do which we can't forgive. But we've got to try. We've got to try and become willing. So if there's somebody that you put on your list that we went back and, and reviewed the list that you couldn't forgive or you couldn't pray for them, put an asterisk next to their name so you can talk about that in depthly when you do your fifth step. If there's a section in the inventory where you're not sure what your part is, if you can't see where one of these four things fits in, put an asterisk next to it and talk about that when you do your inventory, when you do your fifth step with your sponsor. Selfishness is an action. Self-seeking is a motive. To satisfy self is a motive, to be self-seeking. To act selfishly is an action. Okay? So that's the difference between those two things. So that's the resentment part of the inventory. Okay, we're ready to begin. At the bottom of page 67, it says, Notice that the word fear is bracketed alongside the difficulty with Mr. Brown, Mrs. Jones, the employer, and the wife. This short word somehow touches about every aspect of our lives. It's an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. So if you didn't write the word fear in brackets in the third column as you did your resentment inventory, now you don't have that to refer back to. The directions tell us when we skip over to page 68, it says we reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper even though we had no resentment in connection with them. So the first thing that I want to do is take out my piece of paper, draw a line down the left margin, so that I can review my fears. So all I want to do is list my fears. First, I want to write all the fears I have that were on my resentment inventory. So put an asterisk next to the statement that says, we reviewed our fears thoroughly, we put them on paper. 
So I want to review all the, fear, all the fears that are on my resentment inventory. So all the places where I wrote fear in brackets, I want to write those people's names down on my fear inventory. And then it says, we asked ourselves why we had them. So now you just simply ask yourself, why am I afraid? What's my fear? So I'm afraid that my mom's going to give money to my sister. I'm afraid I won't have enough money, right? I'm afraid about my sister taking money from my mom. I'm afraid I'm not going to have enough money. I'm afraid my mom loves my sister more than me. Whatever the situation is, you just write down what you're really afraid of. This requires a little thought on our part, right? You just look at the fear and write down what you're afraid of. Then it also says, even though we had no con resentment in connection with them. So all the fears that you have that don't have a resentment involved, like I'm afraid of the dark. So I'm going to write down, I'm afraid of the dark. And then I'm going to write down why. Why am I afraid of the dark? Because things happen, I can't see what's going on. The boogeyman's there, maybe he's going to get me. So now I'm afraid of the boogeyman, so I write that down too. Whatever your fears are, there's nothing that's ridiculous and nothing that needs to be left off because it's too far-fetched. Every fear you can think of, you write it down. Remember, we started this whole process by saying thoroughness and honesty are the most important things. Nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. What are some fears we can think of that we would write down? Fear of drinking. What else? Of getting caught. Fear of getting caught. <laughs> fear of getting fired. Fear of being alone. What else? Fear of the fourth step. What else? Intimacy. Fear of intimacy. There's all kinds of things that we're afraid of. What you'll notice is that when you start writing these things down, you won't have them as much anymore. So just write them down. All the fears that you can think of. Skipping down, it says, Self-reliance failed us. It says, perhaps we think there is a better way. We think so. We are now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We're in the world to play the role he assigns. Just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us, we humbly and humbly rely upon him. Does he enable us to match calamity with serenity? So it's really just a statement referring back to the third step. We made the decision to quit playing God and look to see what we can contribute. That's what we're talking about. At the bottom of page 68, second to last paragraph, we ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. At once, we commenced to outgrow fear. So you write your fear inventory out, then you review it, and you ask God to take away your fears. It's pretty simple. Just say whatever kind of prayer, whatever wording you want to come up with, the wording's optional. Ask God to take away your fears. Now about sex. Many of us needed an overhauling there. Above all, we try to be sensible on this question. It's easy to get way off track. Here we find human opinions running to extremes. We want to stay out of this controversy. If you ever want to get confused about sex and relationships, bring it up as a topic for discussion in an AA meeting. <laughs> we do not want to be the arbiter of any one sex conduct. That means that AA has no opinion on whether your sex situations are right, wrong, or indifferent. It's not AA's business. AA doesn't care. What we do care about is how it affects us in our sobriety. Halfway down page 69, we reviewed our own conduct over the years. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? Whom did we hurt? Put an asterisk next to that statement. We reviewed our own conduct over the years. On your sex inventory, you're going to want to have three columns. The first is the list of names. It's very easy. So you list all the people that you can think of that you've been involved in sex situations with. <laughs> For some of us, it's a short list. For some, a long list. We're not the arbiter of anybody's sex conduct. Then you ask yourself, where were you selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? Whom did we hurt? Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Where were we at fault? That's what goes in the second column. Every place that you can think of that you were involved with somebody in a romantic relationship, that you aroused jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness, you were selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate, or you caused a harm. It's very simple. So, but we've got three columns. The third column is, we asked ourselves, what should we have done instead? Why do you suppose we want to know what we should have done instead? Exactly, so we don't repeat. It says, in this way, we try to shape a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. It's only by reviewing our sex conduct over the years, looking at who, what we did, and what we should have done instead that we're going to create for ourselves an understanding of how we'd like our life to be in the future. Once again, I want to reiterate, you've already done all this stuff. There's nothing to be scared of. You've lived it. Now you're just writing it down on paper. I would suggest don't write your name and phone number on the top of your inventory. 
just in case it becomes misplaced somewhere. You won't have to worry about anybody knowing who you are or tracking you down. I, I once was uh, getting ready to go do a fist step with my sponsor and, and I took my inventory with me and I'd done a, a relationship inventory specifically on sex and relationships and we went to eat at Houston's over on Windy Hill and I forgot it there. And uh, we got back to his house, we started talking and I realized, you know, I, I left it at the restaurant. So needless to say, we didn't go back. So in this way, we tried to shape a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. We subject each relation to this test, was it selfish or not? We ask God, put an asterisk next to the statement, we ask God to mold our ideals and help us to live up to them. We remembered always that our sex powers were God-given and therefore good, neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be de or despised or loathed. You write your sex inventory, you write down who, what you did, and what you should have done instead. When you get it all finished, you look at it, and then you think about what your sane ideal for your future sex life would be. It's nobody's business but your own. Whatever your ideal turns out to be, an ideal is, a, a, is something you aspire to or to grow to, right? Whatever your ideal turns out to be is your ideal. Then you say a little prayer and you just ask God to help you grow towards that. It's very simple. So at the bottom it says, God alone can judge our sex situation. Counsel with other persons is often desirable, but we let God be the final judge. We realize that some people are as fanatical about sex as others are loose. We avoid hysterical thinking or advice. The best way to avoid hysterical thinking or advice is to not bring sex or relationships up as a topic of discussion at an AA meeting. The best thing to do is to have a private conversation with your sponsor about your sex relations if you need help creating this ideal. That's the fourth step, that's the inventory taking process. You've got three inventories, the resentment inventory, the fear inventory, and the sex inventory. Once you've got all those written, then we move forward with great alacrity, as a teacher of mine used to say, which means really quickly, with doing our fifth step. We do five, six, seven, and eight, and then we move forward and do the ninth step. Moving forward into the next chapter, into action. There's that word again. Starts off by saying, having made our personal inventory, what should we do about it? We've been trying to get a new attitude, a new relationship with our creator, and to discover the obstacles in our path. So we found out when we started taking the first step that our problem was powerlessness, that that was our dilemma, it was a lack of power. So we decided at the second step that we were going to embark on this process of trying to develop a relationship with a power greater than ourselves. And then the third step, we begin that process. So now they're telling us that that's what we've been trying to do up till now, right? Trying to get a new attitude, a new relationship with our creator. The inventory taking process is to discover the obstacles that are in our path of developing that relationship. The fourth step is a big part of that. Just as big is doing the fifth step. The next few pages, he goes to great detail to explain to us some of the considerations we want to have in picking the person to share our fifth step with. Because back in the day, they would mail this book to you wherever you lived. You would follow the set of directions and get sober. So you didn't have a sponsor to lean on. Nowadays, most of us have a sponsor or somebody that we know in AA that we can turn to to do our fifth step with. So we're going to skip over that part. Going forward to page 75, we pocket our pride and go to it, illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. Every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. That means that you don't want to leave anything out on your inventory. All that stuff that you made a list of that you put the asterisks next to, or if there was somebody on the list that you felt like you couldn't forgive, or if there was a sex situation that you felt was so terrible that you would never talk about it with anybody, write those down on a separate sheet of paper, fold it up and put it in your pocket, and bring it with you when you come to do your fifth step. That way, you'll have it with you. By the time you're halfway done with your fifth step, chances are you'll feel comfortable sharing it at that point. If for some reason when you're finished you still don't feel comfortable, take that stuff that you wrote, go to a priest in a confessional, a rabbi, a pastor, a psychologist, the attendant at the quickie mark, or the check, uh, check cashier at the Kroger. It doesn't matter. Go to somebody and spill it. You got to get rid of it. Don't carry it with you. This is the opportunity to get rid of all that stuff that you've been carrying around. Often, the things we think that are the worst really aren't so bad. And chances are, whoever you're doing your fifth step with has done that same thing or even worse. We all carry around this stuff thinking we're the worst people that have ever lived and we've done all these terrible things and we can never get over it and nobody can ever forgive us. And then we start this process and we find out that that's just a story we made up about it and that tons of people, actually in AA millions of people that have gone before us have had the same experience. 
and that they've been able to get through it. So take that separate list with you if you have one, and if you're still not prepared to share about it with the person you're doing your fifth step with, you gotta find somebody else to dump it with before you move forward with the rest of the steps. So it says, once we've taken this step with holding nothing, meaning we didn't hang on to anything, that we, uh, that we swore we'd never tell anybody, we're delighted. We can look the world in the eye. We can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our Creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel we are on the broad highway walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Two thirds of the way down page 75, the paragraph starts, returning home, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour. Put an asterisk next to that sentence, because that's a direction. So after you share your fifth step with somebody, go home, go to the park, go somewhere where, where you can have peace and quiet, not the movie theater, not the bar to shoot pool, sit quietly for an hour, carefully review the first five steps. It says, carefully reviewing what we've done, we thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know him better. Taking this book down from our shelf, we turn to the page which contains the 12 steps. Carefully reading the first five proposals, we ask if we have omitted anything, for we are building an arch through which we shall walk a free man at last. Is our work solid to so far? Are the stones properly in place? Have we skimped on the cement put into our, the foundation? Have we tried to make mortar without sand? So at this point, for most of us, we're going to start to have this real spiritual experience. We're going to feel connected with God in a way that we've never have because we've cleared out a lot of what's been blocking us off from that relationship. So we have a conversation with God, plain and simple, very easy. Thanks for everything. This is great. If it's not great and we're still struggling with something, ask for help with that. Talk about that with your sponsor in that moment rather than moving forward. Okay, make sure you're solid on the first five steps. 